Hi, my name's Andrew Van Lint. I'm a clinical haematology and general medicine trainee. And in this talk, I'll be talking about some of the haematological emergencies to look out for in the context of the final year medical program at Adelaide University. Here are the learning objectives that we're going to be covering. Uh, to be honest, a few of the ones in the metabolic emergencies, namely the lactic acidosis, hypoglycemia and adrenal failure, I'm not going to be covering in this particular talk, but the rest of it I will in detail. Febrile neutropenia has got to be the most common uh, hematological emergency that we would deal with as hematologists, but also that other people, particularly emer um, the emergency and critical care fields, will also be dealing with. This is where usually because of the treatment that we're providing, namely chemotherapy, or sometimes due to the disease that they might have the, itself, such as acute leukemia, the patient has a critically low neutrophil um, count in their bloodstream, or is expected to have that in the in the um, coming 48 hours. So in these particular circumstances, they're quite severely immunosuppressed and the lack of neutrophils means that um, infections can rapidly arise and rapidly progress and they can be very much life-threatening. We define this as being a fever of 38, zero or above, um, a, a, along with an absolute neutrophil count of less than one. Uh, and we would say it's severe if it's less than 0.5. Um, you'll find that because of reference ranges that often uh, like the, the reference range for neutrophils that we use in South Australia through SA pathology is usually the lower one is 1.8. And so you will technically be neutropenic if you're between one and 1.8, but we don't see that as usually being a clinically significant number. It's when they drop below um, a number of 1.0 that it becomes clinically significant and the risk uh, for misadventure rises rapidly. Uh, the big issues here would be gram-positive sepsis, um, gram-negative sepsis, particularly including more resistant organisms like Pseudomonas or the Escapums. Uh, and then that what can occur there is a, is a rapid onset of septic shock requiring intensive care admission. So the timely recognition of febrile neutropenia um, the, and the appropriate administration of broad-spectrum antibiotics is the key kind of take-home messages for managing febrile neutropenia. Uh, a lot of these infections haven't been caught from other people or outside. Uh, I would say probably the majority of infections actually arise from within the body already because we have more bacterial cells than human cells in our body. And it's natural when our, we're immunosuppressed and the effect of chemotherapy on cells is often means there's translocation of bacteria that live in the gut that are usually quite uh, uh, non infective uh, or doesn't have the same pathogenic capacity but when we've suppressed the immune system and damaged all of the lining of the gut through chemotherapy those uh, bacteria suddenly become quite significant and can get into the bloodstream but it can occur through um, you know pneumosepsis skin sources a lot of people have pick lines other things so having a, a broad differential for the source of infection is important and covering with broad spectrum antibiotics is really key in terms of how we treat this um, you've got to get intravenous antibiotics um, on board, ideally within 60 minutes of presentation to a hospital. Um, we use broad spectrum antibiotics, including pseudomonas coverage. So in my institution, the, the uh, standard is preparacillin tazobactam, or also known as tazacin. If you have a penicillin non-anaphylactic allergy, then we would use kefepime that has a similar, though a little bit less um, coverage, but still is covering important ones like staph, strep, and pseudomonas. Um, if you uh, have an anaphylactic reaction to um, kefepime, then we need to consider alternatives like meropenem, which has an excellent broad coverage, um, or combinations of vancomycin and ciprofloxacin to get both that positive and gram-negative coverage appropriately. Uh, ideally, just before you administer the antibiotics, um, you're taking appropriate cultures of urine, peripheral blood, and um, not just peripheral blood, but via any central lines that are present. So if they've got a peripherally inserted central catheter or pick line, um, taking blood cultures from each lumen and naming them by either the number or the letter or the color of that lumen is, is really important. So we can keep track of that. Uh, we also do um, other forms of detecting organisms that are non-culture based, such as polymerase chain reaction um, or nucleic amplification tests, NATs or PCRs. So uh, nasal PCR, especially in the age of COVID, is really, really important. And fecal PCR, if they're presenting with any kind of diarrhea, is also really important to identify things like Clostridium difficile or bacteria that, or viruses that might be um, causing their presentation. 
uh, a chest x-ray as a standard part of the um, looking for pneumonia or other issues um, within the chest is also very helpful. Uh, if they are at all hemodynamically stable, make sure to refer early and often for intensive care because these patients benefit a lot from early intervention uh, with vasopressor support or um, ventilatory support if required. The second group of emergencies I want to cover are critical blood counts. Um, the first of which we'll look at is thrombocytopenia. Thrombocytopenia, um, although you need to have it very, very low for it to be clinically significant, um, thrombocytopenia can herald uh, more serious conditions than the thrombocytopenia itself. And so some of the emergencies we need to consider when we see um, quite a significant thrombocytopenia, namely like less than 30, uh, would be things like acute leukemia, where we're going to look for pancytopenia and the presence of blasts to look for acute myeloid or lymphocytic leukemia. If you've got disseminated intravascular coagulation or DIC, um, a big hallmark of that is quite significant thrombocytopenia. Uh, we would expect there to be anemia there as well. Um, thrombotic thrombocytopenia purpura, a much rarer condition or TTP, but definitely life-threatening. These patients generally present with thrombocytopenia, easy bruising or small uh, signs of bleeding accompanied by acute renal failure and encephalopathy or confusion. Uh, and then um, the more common ITP, what used to be idiopathic now termed immune mediated thrombocytopenia purpura. These patients generally present purely just with um, effects of their low platelet count, namely bruising, particular rash, sometimes epistaxis or gum bleeding, um, sometimes a clinically significant bleed into a muscle or an in internal organ. And generally on the bloods, you'll find that the hemoglobin and white cells are unaffected and it's purely just the uh, platelets that have dropped with no signs of any kind of other coagulopathy happening. And lastly, heparin-associated or heparin-induced um, thrombotic thrombocytopenia syndrome, or HITS, uh, as it's termed, is uh, where there are antibodies that develop um, in the partly due to the presence of heparin and other inflammatory um, features that then they go into a procoagulant state where um, the platelets are consumed, but they don't usually drop to critical levels, which is the giveaway, and they often will have a venous thromboembolism such as a DVT or PE accompanying that drop in platelets, and that needs to be recognised quickly or else they'll continue to, to have further clotting events that can be life-threatening. So um, there are other secondary causes that you also sh should consider and are probably much more common than these emergencies. So a really common one would be hepatic cirrhosis with hypersplenism due to portal hypertension, really common cause for platelet counts below 100, and they often sit between you know, 50 to 80 when they're well compensated. And when they decompensate with their um, hepatic function, they um, can drop below 50 down to 30 or less. Medication induced, such as chemotherapy, uh, methotrexate for other autoimmune conditions, uh, quinine being one that we don't use very much anymore, but it's quite well cited. Um, lots of medications that can cause it um, either through myelosuppression or through drug-induced thrombocytopenia purpura or direct toxic effects on the platelet function. Um, antiphospholipid syndrome is another one or APLS that can drop um, the platelets and so look, testing for that. And then there can be artifactual cases where there's uh, you know, fibrin or clots within the specimen um, because the specimen wasn't handled appropriately or has been in transport for some time. And so um, testing with an appropriate tube, with like an um, acidified citrate uh, tube, ACD tube, uh, can help solve those problems. So um, if we're just thinking about the numbers purely, um, putting aside the potential differential there, um, severity can be considered as mild being below 150, um, moderate being uh, below 80, that's where it starts to become clinically significant and you may you wouldn't be able to do major um, surgical procedures with that kind of number. And then severe being less than 30 when they can start having spontaneous bleeding, uh, which will generally occur more commonly below 10. Um, just remember with these numbers, it's not to say that if they've got one or less than one, they've got one platelet, it's that they've got less than one billion platelets per litre. So we're used to having uh, 200, 300, 400 billion per litre when it drops to less than 10 billion per litre, the, the body isn't used to managing hemostasis with such a deficit, but there are still platelets circulating. So a uh, really important one is to um, first rule out artifact, and so recheck it with an ACD tube, and then you'll get a, a very true result. I've managed a lot of furfies in that way. Um, always ask for a blood film. These will often be um, uh, automatically created just due to the critical result, uh, but if you're not sure, do ask for one, and we're going to look for microangiopathic hemolytic anemia that can be featured with 
um, DIC and uh, TTP and condition in particular, along with BLAST for leukemia and pancytopenia. So that's like three of your major differentials already covered through the film. We then would recommend extended coagulation testing. That's where we're testing the APTT, the INR, um, fibrinogen and D-dimer um, in our laboratories, those four all together. Uh, and so we're looking particularly for DIC, but it might have features of TCP in those situations as well. Um, you should always check for heparin or anoxaparin exposure in the preceding um, five to 30 days and do a 4T score. And if you find that that score is at all elevated, you can send for a hit screen and always write the 4T score on the form or in the clinical history so that they can um, combine that together with a hit screen. And then you should always check their past medical history and medication um, history to check if there's medications or conditions that might cause um, uh, thrombocytopenia, namely cirrhosis or known medications to cause that. Uh, and then once you've done all those, call hematology and we'd love to give you some advice. High white cell count, big issue a lot of the time. Um, often uh, reactive being the most common cause, but there are some more sinister causes uh, that you need to look out for. So if you have a white cell count due to neutrophils, neutrophilia is almost exclusively uh, infection or sepsis being the cause. Um, lymphocytosis can also be through infection, but that they're ones where we start thinking about lymphoma. So some lymphomas can cause lymphocytosis um, and also chronic lymphocytic leukemia or CLL being a really common age-related leukemia where you'll have a rising white cell count in the absence of um, reactive or infection, infectious causes. Eosinophilia, much less common. Um, I think about things like atopic or allergic conditions, uh, I think of parasitic infections or some unusual viruses like HTLV-1. Malignancies, both hematological and solid organ tumours can cause eosinophilia as, long, as well as many of the treatments associated with those conditions and a few other medications. Then you get to monocytes. Uh, monocytosis, also quite uncommon, uh, can occur physiologically with infection. Um, but if it's occurring outside of infection, I do commonly think about and see malignancies such as myelodysplasia, acute myeloid leukemia, and uh, chronic monomyelocytic leukemia, or CMML, which is a, a myelodysplastic condition associated with high monocyte count. Um, the way to investigate this, a CBE with a blood film will really help differentiate between reactive and malignant causes. And then looking for inflammatory markers like C-reactive protein will also give you an indication between that infectious versus malignant kind of point. Um, flow cytometry, if you've got elevated cell counts and you suspect malignancy, you need to tell them what, you, what you're looking for. So, you know, writing lymphocytosis, query lymphoma slash CLL, that will tell the laboratory which test to perform on that particular sample to help characterize the, the clone and the cells. And then, of course, a septic screen with appropriate testing. So if you're thinking eosinophilia, you do need to look for um, parasites in the stool and think about HTLV-1 testing um, or other infections that might cause um, those kind of issues. Superior vena cava obstruction, uh, fortunately an uncommon condition, but one that needs to be taken very seriously. So that's where there's obstruction of the SVC, either from compression or invasion or thrombosis associated with a cancer, typically. So within hematological conditions, lymphoma is a common culprit, and there are some other solid organ tumors that can cause this as well, but um, lymphoma, very common. You can have features of um, congestion uh, within a lot of the veins of the neck and shoulders and upper part of the face. Um, it can look like thoracic outlet obstruction as well. We'll present in a similar way. So um, Pemberton sign can be one uh, clinical feature that, that you may uh, associate. And generally this kind of plethora or flushing of the face um, is a sign of quite advanced F SVC obstruction. Um, you want to confirm that diagnosis with a, a really rapid CT of the chest, um, uh, often with contrast, so that you can uh, see the contrast and, and how or to what degree the SVC is obstructed and what that structure looks like in terms of its malignant potential and whether it fits with um, a lung cancer or a lymphoma, for example. Uh, we then need to diagnose the disease, ideally with a core biopsy, particularly if you're thinking lymphoma. And then once you've got the biopsy, even whilst it's cooking, you could then treat uh, and start to treat that that uh, obstruction, um, particularly with glucocorticoid therapy, uh, dexamethasone or, or methylprednisolone, radiation therapy, so having the radiation oncology team involved at an early point so that they're ready to zap once you've got a diagnosis. 
And then of course, definitive management with immunochemotherapy is generally what we use in hematology. And generally we also will anticoagulate this patient because if there isn't thrombosis there, there is the potential for that. And you wanna make sure that the flow through that already highly narrowed and stenosed SVC remains patent without. Um, so even if there's no thrombosis that's active, you would usually therapeutically anticoagulate these patients to prevent uh, a thrombosis from occurring until the compression or obstruction is relieved. On a similar vein, um, oh, vein, see that hematology joke there? Ha <laughs> ha. Spinal cord compression, uh, not so much a laughing matter. Uh, that's where you get external compression or occasionally direct invasion of the spinal cord by lymphoma or myeloma in a hematological context. Fortunately, is very rare, um, but these patients generally present with back pain and uh, rapidly decreasing ability to mobilize um, due to pain and often weakness. Uh, so you really want to confirm that obstruction again through imaging, in this case, rather than CT uh, and MRI uh, of the spine, ideally the whole spine and potentially brain is desirable, and then diagnosing the disease. So you might already have established myeloma or lymphoma, um, and if it was a indolent lymphoma, you might want to biopsy them to confirm transformation of disease because indolent lymphomas do not commonly cause this. It's usually diffuse large B cell lymphoma transformation that would um, be a more common culprit. Uh, and then again, treatment is, is very similar to SVC obstruction except without the anticoagulation. So uh, steroid therapy, dexamethasone in particular uh, for CNS pen penetration in both myeloma and lymphoma cases. Radiation therapy, highly effective in these cases, and then immunochemotherapy to definitively manage the malignancy. I want to finish on uh, coverage of a couple of key metabolic hematological emergencies. The first one being malignant hypercalcemia. Um, malignant hypercalcemia is the second of the two top causes of, of um, hypercalcemia being parathyroid related, primary, secondary, or tertiary hyperparathyroidism causing hypercalcemia. And then the other um, major cause of hypercalcemia is malignant. So in these cases, um, again, typically lymphoma or myeloma, there is a leaching effect uh, of the bone, where, which is often mediated by um, rank ligand, or in some rarer cases, there's direct invasion of the bone uh, by malignancies, and that can be solid organ tumors as well, resulting in a release of calcium into the bloodstream. Uh, what's the problem with hypercalcemia? Well, one is that they get um, rapidly dehydrated through the high calcium passing through the kidneys. And so that dehydration results in an acute kidney injury. Um, the, when you get to critical levels of hypercalcemia, there is muscle weakness, cognitive dysfunction, sometimes to the point of coma, fortunately rare, but can happen if untreated. And at critically high levels, you can also get supraventricular and ventricular arrhythmias. So definitely a life-threatening condition, but one that fortunately will usually declare itself through, um, really non-specific symptoms of fatigue, some weakness um, and nausea, sometimes vomiting, uh, loss of appetite are often the features that will people present with uh, along with um, high thirst. And, and then it's usually identified through bloods when they present to emergency or their GP. Uh, the management is um, simply starting quite aggressive um, intravenous rehydration uh, through fluids and that will help flush through a lot of the excess calcium in itself. So the ongoing use of that will eventually bring down the calcium levels as well as rehydrate and hopefully um, uh, reverse that acute kidney injury. Uh, and then we usually, for malignant hypercalcemia, we need to manage the malignancy and, and prevent it from, from further leaching the bone. And so we usually use bisphosphonate therapy, so intravenous um, zoledronic acid or permidronate. Um, in, in our circumstances, you can use denosumab, but we generally use bisphosphonates. Um, and then finally, obviously treating the malignancy. So if it's a lymphoma, um, treating the lymphoma. Uh, if it's a myeloma, perhaps some radiotherapy or changing treatment because the disease has become more active uh, would be necessary. Uh, some people present um, with hypercalcemia as the first point that leads to a diagnosis of myeloma or lymphoma. So diagnosing and commencing treatment is a really important part of the management. Uh, on a similar vein of things, um, on a similar topic is tumor lysis syndrome. It's an issue that we uh, are very active in our minds when we commence treatment because it is a risk with the commencement of most um, treatments. Uh, fortunately, it doesn't occur very often, and it, when it does, it's usually of low severity, but it can be a life-threatening condition, which is why we're very aware of it and undertake a lot of efforts to prevent its occurrence. So tumor lysis is where there's a high turnover 
of malignant cells, generally due to um, most commonly the initiation of immunochemotherapy in their first round, but it can be when you've got very aggressive um, lymphoma like diffuse large beetle cell lymphoma or Burkitt's or um, acute leukemias, if they've got a really high cell number or really high tumor burden, just the growth of the tumor and that rapid turnover of cells can cause tumor lysis syndrome itself. Um, what happens then is that through the death of these cells, they're releasing high amounts of potassium and phosphate and also high amounts of nucleic acids. And the one that we get more excited about there is um, purine uh, that can be converted into uric acid. And the uric acid is one of the um, key uh, molecules that we're concerned about managing. So what can happen if you have tumor lysis um, syndrome? There can be hyperkalemia. And of course, the um, prorhythmic effects of hyperkalemia that can be life-threatening. Hypocalcemia, um, which has its own problems. Acute renal failure. And the reason that occurs is that the urate itself can precipitate into crystal form within the tubules and cause um, re partly reversible and partly irreversible damage to the kidneys. So that's probably the one that we're the most concerned about. And that's why, uh, as you'll see, a lot of the management around tumor lysis syndrome targets um, urate. Uh, production or, or metabolism strongly because that's the one that can be um, irreversible if not prevented. Uh, so how do we manage this? Again, um, just turn the tap on, get this person onto some intravenous rehydration to really flush through, reduce the concentration of these electrolytes um, and make sure the kidneys are really well perfused. There are two particular treatments we can use to target um, uric acid. Um, I've con included the uh, metabolism pathway for purine into allantoin, which is a benign end product uh, there. So you can see purine goes to hypoxanthine, um, and then there's xanthine itself, and then uric acid, and then allantoin. Now in humans, we're one of the few creatures on the earth that do not have uricase, as in uric acid oxidase. Uh, and so there are two things that we can do about that. One is that we can reduce the amount of xanthine being produced through xanthine oxidase inhibition. Um, the most common drug we use is um, allopurinol, which is also used for gout through the same mechanism. So you can either prevent the, the production or, or metabolism to uric acid, or in the high risk or ones where we've got really established tumor lysis syndrome, you can actually provide what we wouldn't usually have, which is that uricase or um, uric acid oxidase. And so you can give a drug that's called raspuricase, notice the raspuricase name to remind you what it does, and that effectively will therefore rapidly metabolize the already produced uric acid into the benign form of allantoin that won't damage the kidneys. Pretty cool point. So that's my um, hematological emer emergencies in a nutshell. I hope that's been helpful, and I hope that it will improve your practice. Thanks for listening.